Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering nursing care of the patient in kidney failure. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please like this video. You're gonna love it. Press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Before we get started, I'd also like to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, not a problem. Just go ahead and fast forward. If you are, close your eyes, bow your head. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for waking us up this morning. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us yet again, Lord. <clears throat> This breath of life in our bodies, Father God, thank you. Thank you for our health. Thank you for the health of our children and our loved ones and, you know, the people who are supporting us, Father God. Thank you for those blessings that you bestowed upon us, Lord. Father God, we ask for forgiveness for our sins, Lord, because we know we fall short of your glory every single moment. But Lord, thank you, God, that you sent your son to die on the cross, that we can come before you and we can petition anything that's on our hearts, Father God. And you said, all you have to do is ask and it will be given to us. And Lord, I tell you, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father God, I pray for every single viewer, Lord. I ask that you please help them. They've each come to my channel for their own specific reason. But Lord, I ask that you please help them to study, help them to understand this information. Father God, if the viewer that's watching right now, they're having a problem with procrastinating or not studying when they're supposed to or not studying for as long as they're supposed to or not having the energy to get up and study. Lord, I, whatever that obstacle is, I ask that you please remove it, Father God, so they can buckle down, they can study, they can understand the information and go take that test and pass. Father God, I ask that you please bless these students and allow them to be a blessing to others, Father God. When they're blessed with that license, let them not keep that blessing to themselves, but let them care for others and be kind to others and help heal others, Father God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for the mercy that you've shown myself and you've shown every single viewer watching. Father God, thank you for this gift that you've given me to be able to teach nursing information in a way that's palatable to the students in a way that they can understand it. Thank you for that, Father God. Lord, I ask that as we go over this video, Lord, every single thing that I discuss, I ask that you please help the viewers to be able to understand it, to be able to process it, and when they see these same concepts again, to be able to answer the question correctly and accordingly. Thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. The nurses care for a client in the diuretic stage of acute renal failure should assess for manifestations of A, dehydration, B, hypertension, C, hypokalemia, or D, metabolic acidosis. And guys, the correct answer is A, dehydration. Now, let's think about it. Go back to the question, what phase of acute renal failure is this patient in? The diuretic phase, this is in the phase where that kidney's recovering and the patient's urinating a lot, up to a thousand milliliters a day. So they can lose so much fluids that they go into um, dehydration. So that's going to be our biggest concern A is the correct answer. A client with acute renal failure is allowed a specific amount of fluid by mouth during 24 hours in order to A, compensate for insensible and measured fluid losses during the previous 24 hours, B, equal the expected urine output for the next 24 hours, C, prevent hyperkalemia, which could lead to serious cardiac dysrhythmia, or D, prevent the development of complicating hypostatic pneumonia. What do you guys think the answer is? And the correct answer is A, to compensate for the sensible and measured fluid losses during the previous 24 hours. And so the losses that they're talking, guys, talking about, these are losses, the insensible losses are losses that really can't be measured, such as, you know, every time you speak, you're losing fluids, right? You're losing fluids from respiratory. You're losing fluids from when you sweat. Even when you defecate, you're losing some amount of fluid from your from your feces, okay? That's what's known as insensible fluid loss, and that is the correct answer. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. We have B, equal the expected urine output for the next 24 hours. This is your daily INO, and you know, if a patient has lost more in the previous 24 hours, you may want to make it up in the next 24 hours. But look what this is saying, equal the expected urine output for the next 24 hours. No, absolutely not, false. Uh, look at C, prevent hyperkalemia, which could lead to serious cardiac dysrhythmias. Let me tell you what they did there. And the test writers do that all the time to trick you. So the first thing I want to tell you is um, 
allowing that patient a specific amount of fluid during the 24 hours, that is not going to do C, prevent hyperkalemia. It's just not. That it does not prevent hyperkalemia. But look what the test writer did. They wrote to prevent hyperkalemia, comma, which could lead to serious cardiac dysrhythmias. Well, hyperkalemia can lead to uh, serious cardiac dysrhythmias. That part is absolutely true. But the first part to prevent hyperkalemia, that is false. And if you guys watch my previous videos on test taking skills, I tell you that all the time. That's what the test writers do. They will give you a correct answer choice comma and everything after the comma is incorrect. Or they'll give you an incorrect answer choice comma and everything after the comma is absolutely true. And they do that to make that answer choice enticing to you. It makes you want to choose it because part of the answer is so true but guess what if a hundred percent of your answer choice is not correct even if it's one tiny little bit that's wrong the whole thing is wrong choose your second best answer okay do not fall for that so uh, that makes C wrong. Look at D, prevent the development of complicating hypostatic pneumonia. Uh, that absolutely does not prevent the complications of hypostatic pneumonia. That's false. So the correct answer guys is A. The nurse explains that a cation exchange resin such as K-exalate will A, decrease diastolic blood pressure, B, stimulate diuresis by osmosis, C, increase appetite by decreasing insulin degradation, or D, increase GI potassium excretion. What do you guys think? And the correct answer, guys, is D, increase GI potassium excretion. So let's talk about this. That K, you see in K exhalate, what's the sign for potassium? It's the K and the plus, right? So when you see K exhalate, I want you to think of potassium because what it does, it binds that potassium. So when the patient goes and has a bowel movement, boop, it comes out. They excrete it through their um, stool. That's the correct answer. Increasing the gastrointestinal potassium excretion. It binds it and makes the potassium come out in the stool. So a patient who has hyperkalemia, that's a way of getting it down. Now. Something I want to talk to you guys about before I go over the wrong answer choices. You may get a test question that's telling you the patient has hyperkalemia and they need um, to get the potassium down immediately. Well, the, uh, this medication, k even though it's a great medication to bring down that potassium, if we need, if it's an acute situation and we need to bring down that potassium immediately, we're not going to give them k because look how k works. Look at your choice. D, it works in the GI tract. The GI tract takes time. It takes time for it to bind. It takes time for that peristalsis to get going for the patient to feel like they have a bowel movement to get it out of that patient system. So that's the second thing I want to bring to your attention. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, decreased diastolic blood pressure. k is not an antihypertensive. Wrong. B, stimulate diuresis by osmosis. K exhalate is not an osmotic diuretic. And then C, increase appetite by decreasing insulin uh, degradation. This medication is not an, um, an appetite stimulant. So the correct answer, the only correct answer choice here, guys, is choice D, increasing the GI potassium excretion. Next question. The nurse explains to a client's family that the most common overall manifestations of acute renal failure is that A, expected urine output is altered, B, the client's breath develops fruity odor, C, the urine-specific gravity is greater than 1.040, or D, urine develops a root beer color. What do you guys think? And guys, the correct answer is A. I hope you guys all chose A. Expected urine output is altered. Think about it. If the kidney's not function, functioning the way it's supposed to, and the kidney's responsible for filtering the blood and creating the urine and getting rid of and excreting the urine, obviously the urine excretion is going to be decreased. That patient may have oliguria, they may have anuria, but definitely we're going to see an alteration in uh, the urine output. So A is the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. B, expect client's breath develops fruity odor. Okay, that's giving me diabetes mellitus vibes, right? That's giving me ketoacidosis. Choice C, urine specific gravity greater than 1.040. Lots of things can cause it. One of them including what? Diabetes insipidus. Remember diabetes insipidus where the patient is letting go of, oh, I'm lying. 
That's the opposite. Not diabetes insipidus. What's the one where they're holding on to the urine? Um, SIDH. SIDH. So remember SIADH where the patient's holding on to all of their urine, right? They're holding on to all of their urine, but the little bit of urine that they do let go, the urine specific gravity is high. All of the solutes, the sodium, everything leaves with the urine. So, and by the way, guys, your normal urine is supposed to be, you know, the specific gravity is supposed to be between 1.010 and 1.030, right? Some books may say 35, whatever. This is 40. So having that high urine specific gravity, that gives me SIADH vibes, something like a kind of disorder where the urine specific gravity would be increased, but not in the case of the patient that's in acute renal failure. Choice D, urine develops a root beer color. That would be something in the, um, such as uh, glomerulonephritis, where the patient uh, urine will have that root beer or coffee or cola colored urine, but not acute renal failure. In acute renal failure, what we see is an alteration in the actual urine output. Because remember, what the job of the kidneys is, is to filter the blood, create urine, and excrete that urine. All right? So A is the correct answer. Well, the kidneys help with excretion of urine because you guys know the urine has to go to the bladder and then the bladder actually releases the urine, but you guys know what I mean. Okay, next question. While caring for a client in the oliguric phase of acute renal failure, the nurse's plan of care should include A, encouraging fluid intake to prevent dehydration, B, increasing the client's protein intake to prevent muscle wasting, C, maintaining reverse isolation to prevent infection, or D, meticulous skin care to prevent skin breakdown. What do you guys think? Okay, guys, and the correct answer is D, meticulous skin care to prevent skin breakdown. So let's go back to the question. And the question, what phase of acute renal failure is that patient in? The oliguric phase. That means they're holding on to all the urine. They're holding on to all the fluid. Causing what? Edema, right? We're going to be concerned about skin breakdown. So we're going to cause, um, not cause, but we're going to make sure that patient has meticulous skin care. We're going to make sure that, you know, they're going to be, uh, on an air um, uh, pressure reducing mattress. We're going to make sure that we turn them every two hours, right? Skin care is going to be very important to us because that, that uh, edema can cause skin breakdown. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, encouraging fluid intake to prevent dehydration. I just told you oliguric means to hold on to your fluid because you're not urinating. If the patient's not urinating, they're holding on to all their fluid. Why would they need more fluid? Are we trying to put them in fluid overdose? Wrong. B, increasing the client's protein intake to prevent muscle wasting. Then acute renal failure. Why would we be giving them protein? They should be on protein restrictions, right? They're in the oliguric phase. They should be on protein restrictions. So that's false. And then C, maintaining reverse isolation to prevent infection. There's no infection going on. There's no mention of infection. And um, a patient who's going through acute renal failure, that has nothing to do with infection. And there's nothing in the question that tells us the patient has some type of infection. So that's wrong. D is a correct answer choice. The client with chronic renal failure who would not be a candidate for peritoneal dialysis is a client, A, who had diabetes mellitus, B, who is a 10-year-old child, C, with severe cardiovascular disease, or D, with severe respiratory disease. And before I tell you what the answer is, let's say you guys had no clue, no clue what the answer should be, right? As a student, if I had no idea what the answer should be, automatically I would choose between C and D just because it had severe in it. Okay? So I would have got rid of A and B and I would have taken my chance and choose between C and D. So the correct answer, guys, is uh, D, the client with severe respiratory disease. Now, there are lot, lots of contraindications for peritoneal dialysis. Patients who are obese, Cannot, should not be getting peritoneal dialysis. Patients with abdominal infections, patients with abdominal cancer, patients with history of ruptured diverticulitis, uh, diverticulitis or um, what's that word I'm looking for? Um, 
it's going to come to me. But patient with history of uh, appendicitis that have ruptured, those type of abdominal issues are contraindicated in peritonitis and severe respiratory disease also, guys, is included. All of those are contraindicated. Next question. Perforation. So any patient who's had perforation of any abdominal organs, that will also be a contraindication to peritonitis. The nurse explains to a client with chronic renal failure that the rationale for receiving calcium carbonate is that it A, binds with phosphorus to eliminate it from the body, B, binds with potassium to eliminate it from the body, C, helps to prevent constipation, or D, helps prevent ulcer formation. And the correct answer is A. It binds with the phosphorus to eliminate it from the body. That's, that's, that's what it does. That's the action of the drug. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. Look at B. Binds with potassium to eliminate from the body. What's the drug that does that? Remember k -exalate? Yes. Choice C. Helps prevent constipation. Those would be medications such as, you know, stool softeners or maybe the patient could take fiber or even increase fluids and, you know, move move around, become more active, Active. all of those are measures to prevent constipation. Choice D, help prevent ulcer formation. Things like PPIs and uh, uh, H2 blockers, those will help prevent a, um, ulcer formation. But when we're talking about medications, um, where is it? The, the reason why a patient with renal failure would get the calcium carbonate, remember, the kidney's not working the way that it's supposed to, so the patient is not getting rid of these fluid and electrolytes the way that they're supposed to. We don't want that patient to have a toxic or a high level, so they can get that um, they can get that medication to bond, bind with the phosphorus to get it out of the body. Okay. In caring for a chronic dialysis patient with an AV fistula, the nurse would A, avoid getting the fistula site wet during the client's bath, B, irrigate the fistula with heparin to prevent clotting, C, not use the arm with the fistula when taking the client's blood pressure, or D, perform dressing changes to, perform, to, excuse me, to prevent infection. What do you guys think the answer is? And I know by now, unless you're new. If you guys have been following me, you know what the answer is. I've talked about this too many times. The correct answer is C. Not use arm with fistula when taking the client's blood pressure. No blood pressure um, checks in that arm. No um, injections in that arm. No blood draws in that arm where the AV fistula is, okay? So C is the correct answer choice. Next question. A client's been found to have an acceptable, to be an acceptable candidate for a kidney transplant. The nurse counsels the client and family that the client now faces the greatest impediment to renal transplantation, which is A, high potential for rejection, B, high risk for infection, C, insufficient financial resources, or D, lack of sufficient donor organs. Now, before I tell you what the answer is, all of these choices, A, B, C, and D, all of these are obstacles and barriers, very relevant to getting that transplant. But the number one barrier is D, lack of sufficient donor organs. That's the biggest obstacle to getting that kidney transplant. Three months after a kidney transplant, a client develops fever, graft tenderness, malaise, elevated white blood cell count. The nurse conducts further assessment based on understanding that the likely cause of these manifestations is A, graft rejection, B, influenza, C, pyelonephritis, or D, urinary tract infection. Now, before I tell you what the answer is, no, let me tell you what the answer is first, then we'll talk. So the correct answer, guys, is A, graft rejection. They told us, gave us so many clues. The first clue, they told us patient just had a kidney transplant, right? They just had a kidney transplant th three months ago. 
Why are they telling us patients just had, they had a kidney transplant and now we're seeing, we're seeing a fever, we're seeing graft tenderness. So they're having tenderness right over that area where they had that procedure. They're having malaise at just that general feeling of just feeling so horrible. horrible. We're seeing elevated WBCs. You're suspecting that the body's starting um, to reject that graft, graft rejection. Now, let's say you had no idea what the answer was, no clue. You guys have to look at the answer choices to see if you have some kind of clue to help you figure it out. And if you notice with this, these choices, B, C, and D all have something in, in common. Those are all infections, the flu, pyelonephritis, um, UTI, all of those are infections except for A. So as a student, if I saw this was multiple choice and I saw B, C, and D all had something in common, I would choose the oddball out, which still would, would have been A, okay? A is the correct answer. A client with renal failure has an order to infuse dopamine intrapin to activate the dopamine receptors in the kidney. The nurse will set the infusion rate for a, 21 to 25, B, 11 to 20, six, uh, C, 6 to 10, or D, 1 to 5. And guys, the correct answer is that lowest dose, the 1 to 5. The low doses of uh, dopamine, guys, that can be enough to activate those uh, receptors in the kidney. The correct answer is D. Wow, we're already down to our last question. I feel like I rushed through this video. I'm not sure if I did. Let me know in the comment section. But if I did, that's because I don't have my watch on me. But it's late at night. I'm tired. I'm ready to go to bed. So forgive me. Um, <laughs> we're down to our last question, guys. If you want to see a part two, let me know. And I will make sure I go ahead and create a part two for you. Okay? Last question. For the nurse trying to assist the client with renal failure to stay within the prescribed fluid restriction, the least helpful strategy would be to A, give medication at mealtime, B, provide frequent oral hygiene, C, put allotted water into spray bottle, or D, use ice chips liberally instead, instead of fluids. All right, guys, so this patient is on fluid restrictions. The least helpful thing to do is D. Use ice chip, chips liberally. Liberally, that means a whole lot liberally instead of fluids. Well, when ice melt, what, is, what do you think it turns into? Fluids, okay? It should have said something like giving the ice chips judiciously in very small amounts, not liberally. So guys, D is the correct answer choice. Again, please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Um, don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I have a video that's released just like this where I go over test questions. I teach you how to answer it. I teach you how to eliminate wrong answer choices. And I've decided not every week, but some weeks, I'm going to go ahead and release a surprise video for you guys Wednesday in the evenings, just like the ones I'm doing on Sunday um, on Sunday afternoon. Um, I think it'll help in between... Uh, the week where I actually do the lessons and I kind of teach you how to study and how to read the book and how to pull out important content. Don't forget, guys, also, if you're interested in covering nursing topics on a daily basis, check out my TikTok, my Instagram, and Facebook. Almost daily, I cover a variety of nursing topics and I go over the answers and the rationale. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.